Hi. So I wanted to explain something called gyroscopic precession, and it's part of a larger explanation, although this video is going to be a standalone, uh, where I want to explain how these little doohickeys called rollerons, although this is a 3D printed sort of uh, demonstrator rolleron, not a particularly functional one because it's not quite heavy enough. And uh, those are used by this uh, Sidewinder missile that I also have a little representative model of. But first we need to understand why gyroscopic precession happens, so I'm going to do an explanation of that. And so uh, probably the most common example that you might have seen already is if you take something like a, a top and you just get it spinning, uh, it will, well, it'll also run around the, the rim of the this plate here because it's container, but uh, as you see, as it, as it sort of starts to run out of angular momentum and spin down, uh, it doesn't just, you know, plop straight over, right? It kind of does this weird, well, processing thing uh, before it falls over. And so there's a, another famous demo that you might have seen before and I've actually done before, but I'm going to do it again because it's a good demo, where we take a bicycle wheel, uh, which is a good sort of it's not the weight, it's something called the moment of inertia, uh, but it has a good large moment of inertia that we can use to demonstrate this effect. So, let me angle up a little bit. And so, this is going to be all about keeping track of sort of, uh, you know, left and right mirror images of things, and converse, and sort of uh, closely associated with that, keeping track of clockwise and counterclockwise, right? Because, you know, sort of uh, clockwise... Uh, from one direction is counterclockwise from the other direction. So this is, right now, this is clockwise for you, and now it's counterclockwise for you, because uh, you're facing from the camera, I'm facing towards the camera, so uh, it look, we, we see, uh, we things, see things from uh, opposite directions, but uh, op that's not the same thing as uh, a mirror image, and we're going to be uh, very carefully delving into the difference there. But uh, let me just show you show you what happens real quick. So if I suspend this wheel from just one side using this cord, right, and the other side I have in my hand, if I if I let it go when it's not spinning, it just falls over, right? But what I can do instead is first I can get it spinning. And so this is spinning clockwise relative to your point of view, which is counterclockwise from my point of view. And we're suspending it from uh, my side. And instead of falling over, it's sort of, well, it processes around, right? Uh, it spins around to this other axis and changes its axis of rotation, actually, so that it's moving around like that. And this way, it looks sort of top-down like it's processing clockwise. Uh, and then if I hold it from my side and get it spinning uh, clockwise from your point of view, counterclockwise from my point of view, and then let it go, then it processes clockwise looking top-down, which would be counterclockwise looking bottom-up. And so, well, I have to keep track of that very carefully, right? So now let's try the opposite. Let's suspend it from the side facing you. And now let's get it going. Uh, clockwise again, uh, or getting, get, like, get it going, what's that, uh, clockwise from your point of view, and then let's let go, and then now it spins counterclockwise looking from the top down, or uh, clockwise from the, looking from the bottom up, again, suspend it from your side and get it spinning uh, counterclockwise from your point of view, and then it goes clockwise. So why does that happen? It's actually kind of not that mysterious when you delve into it. Not that I want to ruin the mystique. In fact, uh, I think it is very cool, and it's, uh, but it's also very cool when something sort of counterintuitive turns out to be uh, explainable in terms of things that are reasonably intuitive, right? So there's a, a loose analogy with uh, linear motion, although spinning and moving in a straight line are different in some important ways, but we can make an analogy and there are some similarities, right? If I, if I just let this fall under the force of gravity, it just falls in a straight line. 
but if I first get it, get it, give it some momentum, right? If I give it a little toss, well, it doesn't fall in a straight line; it falls in uh, an arc, right? So it's a, it's a bit like that, except uh, it's uh, you know much stranger, right? Because it, the arc forms this uh, continuous circle as it processes around, um, and so you know uh, why that happens. Well, just bear in mind we need to understand there's a, a difference between rotating counterclockwise and rotating clockwise um, from a given point of view, right? There is an actual difference between um, angular momentum one way and angular momentum another way, right? You know, spinning in the opposite direction is not just the same as looking at the same thing from the other way, but if you, if you do look at something from the other direction, you will describe it counterclockwise versus counterclockwise the other way around. Uh, but the thing that um, you will have the same answer to regardless of which direction you look from is uh, what we call the angular momentum vector, right? Um, which again, making an analogy with linear motion, right? Uh, if you look at it from this way, you'd say it's coming towards you. If you look at it from this way, you'd say it's going away from you. Uh, but in both cases, you'd agree that there is a, you know, a, a you could agree that there's a velocity vector that points this direction. Uh, although you would describe that, that, what that direction is differently, whether the direction is away from you or towards you is depends on which way you're looking. Uh, but that the velocity vector is this way uh, is a sort of objective reality. Uh, so, but uh, having just touted the benefits of objective reality, uh, let's go into virtual reality where uh, this is a bit easier to explain because it's, uh, well, I'm not limited by my uh, sort of mechanical get-ups here. We can use uh, renderings. So this is a hopefully somewhat clearer three-dimensional version of that drawing I had on the paper showing uh, red, green, and blue for x, y, and z perpendicular directions. And so we're going to just go over the vector cross product here. And remember that that's where you have, in this convention, it would be the cross product of green to the right cross blue going up is equal to the red one, which is coming uh, sort of towards us. And so remember then it's going to be proportional to the length of the blue one and proportional to the length of the green one. But then also the red one is proportional to the angle between the green and the blue. And that runs sort of so that you can make it bigger and smaller. But also if you sort of flip one of them all the way around, so we flip the green one all the way around, well, that actually means that the red one is also going to get flipped all the way around too. And so again, looking at, uh, you know, looking at things from opposite directions, you see you know, clockwise versus counterclockwise, but in this case, it's actually reversing the direction of the vector itself. All right, so now how does that apply to our system of a spinning ring thingy? Well, now if you look at this sort of toothed wheel I have drawn here, the green arrow is the distance from the center, and in just a moment, the blue arrow is going to be the speed, or the velocity, rather, of the edge of the circle, and then the red arrow is going to be the angular momentum vector, which is, well, just like how if something's moving in a straight line, it has linear momentum. If it's spinning around, it has angular momentum. So if we get this thing spinning, the blue arrow gets bigger and bigger because it's moving faster and faster. And then the red arrow is that cross product. It's sort of shifted around a little bit, but same idea. And if we reverse the wheel, now make it go clockwise. Now the red arrow, notice, is pointing away from us. And if we flip around and look at it from the other side, then we see now it looks like it's going counterclockwise, but also now the red vector is pointing towards us again. So everything is perfectly consistent but it's a little bit uh, dicey to keep track of it all sometimes. So to make things just a little bit simpler, let's take a look at that at again, but this time uh, from a little bit different point of view. Let's look right down the axis, so now the red arrow is coming right towards us, but now let's uh, start rotating ourselves, even though this is a little bit nauseating. Uh, so now we're spinning along with the wheel, and now you can see the vectors the way they were before, but uh, I'm just drawing the blue arrow in place instead of putting them with all of their vases next to each other like I did in the original example. Uh, and again, if we, but again, if we shrink the blue arrow back down to zero, the red arrow goes to zero because if we're not spinning, we have no angular momentum, which I think makes perfectly good sense. 
But that just explains the situation where it's spinning and it's not changing the axis that it spins along. But uh, how do we explain our precession situation where the axis is changing? Well, we're going to get to that in a second because we need the actual red arrow to start swinging around, which is going to involve adding another arrow to it. And this is addition, not the cross product. A very important distinction that we're going to discuss here. Because the next thing we need to talk about is torque, right? So just like how we have, you know, something spinning has angular momentum. Well, you have to get angular momentum just like you get linear momentum by, you know, pushing on something you, to make something go. You have to, to give it a push, right? So if you want something to spin, you need to give it a, a torque, a twist, right? And so... Uh, Torque follows the same clockwise versus counterclockwise rule, right? Where if something is, from our point of view, going counterclockwise, the vector points towards us. And if it's uh, the torque is going away from us, then the vector points clockwise. And this maybe makes sense if you can remember how standard screws and bolts work, where if you turn them clockwise, they go in, and if you turn them... Uh, counterclockwise they get pulled out right and so correspondingly our torque vector is out when we twist counterclockwise and it's in when we go clockwise in this case you know down so the last thing we need before we can start explaining the precession phenomena is we need to explain how to add vectors together right because these are all ve these arrows are all vectors so to do that we just Put them tip to tail we say right so this is why i don't do the we don't normally do the cross product as uh with all of the with tip to tail format is because we don't want to confuse it with the vector sum uh, but i've been leaving them sort of in the locations that makes sense right because you apply the force at the end of the green vector uh, or the velocity is happening at the end of the green vector so that makes it easier to keep track of the clockwise versus counterclockwise. Uh, but usually when we see vectors lined up tip to tail like this, that's to uh, do the to do addition, right? So in this example, we have a blue arrow, and to that we are going to add a green arrow, and the sum of those two is the red arrow, where it just goes from the base of the first vector to the end of the second vector, and you put first and second together with the base of one touching the tip of the other. And, well, that's pretty straightforward. So now we're finally ready to discuss the precession phenomena in detail. So now things are going to get a little bit more complicated. And to make it not so terrible, uh, we're going to reduce our spinning ring just to down to two spinning point masses on uh, either end of a rod. So right, we've got these two big brick looking things they're just you know two heavy objects on the either on either side of that thin little spindle in the middle uh, so that uh, none of the connecting rods really weigh much compared to those big old masses on the end uh, and this is kind of the simplest system that can have angular momentum um, right it's just two like weights on either end of a like connecting rod there so if we get this uh, spinning up, you can see the same thing as before, where we have the angular momentum vector pointing out uh, relative to the direction where we are looking at it spin counterclockwise. And so how do we explain precession then? Well, first off, let's freeze time so that this is a little easier to analyze. Well, that goes back to what we were looking at before, where we need to have some angular momentum being added, right? And remember, angular momentum gets added when we apply uh, a torque. And so how are we applying a torque? Well, we're applying a torque by applying a force off-center from the mass. So oh, in this case, uh, and this is where the number of arrows gets a little bit convoluted, but bear with me. So we bring in all of these other arrows, right? So the there's some color coding here to make it uh, not such a complete nightmare where uh, red is the angular momentum, green is distance, blue is velocity, uh, magenta is the angular momentum that's being added, or the rate of change of angular momentum, 
uh, orange is force and cyan is the uh, change in the velocity, right? So let's sort of unpack this for a second, right? So imagine that we're pulling down, right, with that orange arrow, and we're doing so on the on the handle to that's uh, you know to the right, the side that the uh, red arrow is coming out of, and there would also need to be a corresponding up force uh, on the other side to make so that we're not just just pulling down we're also uh, you know holding it up uh, and that's why i i'm not fond of when people will call this like an anti-gravity device it's like because the anti-gravity device is just the, the the like the string holding it up right with the bicycle wheel it's just a question of why doesn't it uh you know uh, flip over right it, it's being held up by you know net force uh, so, but uh, anyways, I, for simplicity's sake, we're only drawing it as this one down down arrow. Um, and so, again, remember our conventions of clockwise and counterclockwise. Well, if we're looking down the axis from this perspective it's rendered from, right, the green arrow's to the right and the orange arrow is down, so that would be a clockwise torque, so that would mean the arrow would go away from us, which is what that magenta arrow does. But then let's think about uh, which way would that cause the mass to move, right? Because that's effectively adding a bit of angular momentum that would cause the whole thing to spin uh, in sort of a, a clockwise direction uh, in that uh, plane, right? And so that would kind of be like, you know, we're not going to go through a full revolution, but that would be kind of like to this, like this right? Um, and that's the way that that little magenta arrow points. And okay, that's all fine and good. So, but, um, you know, it might, there's a little bit of confusion there, because, right, because it's like, well, why doesn't, why doesn't it rotate the other way, right? Because it seems like, you know, the, if I have the uh, cyan arrow at the tip, at the end of the blue arrow, it should be rotating uh, about the vertical axis. Well, remember, that's just to add the vectors together, right? Really, both of them are the velocity of the uh, sort of cube thingy and so they should both be coming out of the cube so you can move them uh, but then you need to put them uh, tip to tail in order to add them and then the final result is a velocity vector that's coming sort of uh, you know more towards us uh, and then that means the angular momentum vector needs to be going you know well uh, shifted a little bit uh, sort of into the uh, into the uh, the void of the rendering there and then uh, exactly what we would expect happen happens, which is that the uh, sort of uh, axis of rotation precesses counter counterclockwise as viewed from the top, uh, right? And so that's uh, exactly what it's like when we were doing it with the bicycle wheel. So uh, there you have it. That's uh, why gyroscopic precession happens. Probably uh, clear as mud, but uh, yeah. Let me know if you have questions. Bye.